Good morning. It's good to see you all. We are finally out of the second book of the Apostle Peter. We are in a transition period. I always do, or typically do this, especially when we're transi transitioning into a, a heavy book like Judges, which we're going to get into. But we'll take some time and look at some psalms. And I'm preaching out of one of my favorites this morning. It's Psalm 144, just two simple verses. And, and here's why it's one of my favorites. First of all, it's a psalm that... I have meditated on a lot. I pray through quite often. I typically read at least once a day. I'm one of those guys that, you know, repetition really helps me. And so this particular psalm does that for me. And so read with me there, Psalm 144, verses 1 and 2. In the prescription uh, there, just the, giving us who wrote it, it says, Of David, blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. He is my steadfast love and my fortress, my stronghold and my deliverer, my shield, and he in whom I take refuge, who subdues peoples under me. Now then, you know, there's nothing worse than not knowing you're in a fight. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like my kid brother, Joey. Joey was bigger than me, although he was younger. And I, I never really messed with him. I didn't pick on him. I didn't pick on either one of them. They might say different, but I didn't think that I did. But the reason for it with Joey was because uh, he could turn on you so quickly, you know. And so I remember the last fight that we got into, I thought we were just horsing around. You know, we were wrestling in the bedroom. And, uh, you know, before I know it, I'm on my back. And this was before UFC, but he's doing, you know, that ground and pound thing. And I'm like, oh, this is for real. And before I, I and by that time, he's like 17. So he's a stout kid. And again, bigger than me. So the only reason I got him off without getting knocked out is because my other brother, Shannon, drug him off, you know. And, and we were all good. We were kidding around. And then I was in a fight for my life. There's nothing worse than being in a fight having no clue. And by the way, I think that's what's going on in the church as a whole and in the lives of God's people as individuals. For instance, we are currently experiencing in our world, or what we are currently experiencing is revealed to us in Scripture, not just as physical, materialistic things going on around us in our world, but rather spiritual warfare. Of course, we only see the material or physical aspects of it, but behind the veil, this war has been initiated by demonic powers and entities, powers that are hell-bent on distorting and destroying the image of God as seen in humanity. This spiritual war in God's creation manifests itself in horrific ways, such as human and child trafficking. We can see that. We have evidence of it. Gender dysphoria. The indoctrination of our children into sexual perversion and mutilation. Open borders that allow drug cartels to run rampant in our communities, spreading things like fentanyl, which are like an epidemic nowadays. And it gets much closer to home. The dissolution of the family, broken marriages, broken children as a result. We are seeing a generation that is being raised without that foundation. And we see a rise in things such as self-harm, drug, alcohol abuse even suicide. All the things you and I see every day have a root cause, a source. The Apostle Paul allowed us to see the spiritual reality of our situation in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. Notice what he said there. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. You know, as we read that, we, we have to understand, make no mistake, the day God saved you from sin and death was the day you also became a soldier for Christ. And from that day forward, you have been on the front line, in the trenches, often perhaps in retreat. Why? Because so many of us are blissfully ignorant of the spiritual carnage and combat happening all around us and to those we love as well. 2 Timothy 3 through 4 reminds us, endure suffering along with me. By the way, the Apostle Paul is the one that wrote this. Where did he write it from? 
from a nice church office, air conditioning. No, he, he wrote it from a Roman prison. So when he talks about suffering, he's not just like, oh, woe is me, I'm a poor victim. That's not his mentality at all. No, this guy's a soldier. And he's already been taken behind enemy lines. He's in prison and he's writing from there, still fighting the good fight. And so when he says, endure suffering along with me, he's talking about the norm. Open your eyes to what's normal in the Christian life. Endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. And as Christ's soldier, do not let yourself become tied up in the affairs of this life. For then you cannot satisfy the one who has enlisted you in the army, in his army. That line there in verse 4. Do not let yourself become tied up in the affairs of this life. This is part of the problem, isn't it? We are so concerned with money. We're so concerned with our looks. We're so concerned with our health. We're so concerned with our freedom, with our comfort, with Everything that we think is valuable, which, by the way, in the grand scheme of things, is nothing but subject to moth and rust. In other words, you don't get to take any of it with you. And yet, this is where we put all of our energy into, all of our passion, wanting something that ultimately is going to be taking away, taken away. And no wonder we cannot fight the good fight. No wonder we're combat ineffective, if you will. And I believe we've suffered long enough at the hands of our enemies. It's time for men and women of faith to stand side by side, together in one spirit, with one purpose, to fight together for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this morning, we're going to learn how to do just that as we look at three aspects of training for spiritual warfare. Now, our purpose, it's real straightforward, is to prepare you... For spiritual warfare, that's it, to engage in this, to endure through it, to have victory finally in it, Uh, to realize and open your eyes that, oh, this is a real fight, I'm in a fight, I best get swinging, and so that's what we're going to learn. Battle has already commenced, you might as well be ready. So let's dig in, three aspects of training for spiritual warfare. Here's the first one, God is worthy of praise for training you to engage in spiritual warfare. He's worthy of praise for training you. Look at verses 1 and 2 again. Psalm 144 of David, Blessed be the Lord my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. He is my steadfast love and my fortress, my stronghold and my deliverer, my shield and he in whom I take refuge, who subdues peoples under me. Sounds like a very rough psalm, doesn't it? And some of them are. They're referred to as these, um, uh, they're, they're the type of psalms that you almost, and this one qualifies, where you're praying against your enemies and you're reminding yourself of the power of God in you that is derived strictly by faith. It's nothing else. It's not because you're big and bad yourself or you're smarter than everybody else in the room or you're more spiritually qualified or adept. It, it has nothing to do with that. We're all at ground zero. Only God in us and through us is capable of doing these things. And so right here at the beginning of verse 1, we see that this is, again, a psalm of David. David was many things. A shepherd that tended his father's flocks. A warrior that eventually killed a giant named Goliath. An outcast that fled from King Saul's wrath, the king of Israel. A king that led the armies of Israel. He had, by his own account, fought many battles and shed much blood. And bear in mind that in Matthew chapter 1, we find that Jesus, the promised Messiah, the one and only Savior of the world, was a direct descendant of King David. Now, this has a very important meaning behind it. In other words, all the battles David ever fought, all the bloodshed, it wasn't just a man fighting for his life. It's not just a a record, rather, of, of a warrior. It was a spiritual attack. All of those things that happened to him, these were spiritual attacks orchestrated by Lucifer himself and carried out by the rulers, the authorities, the cosmic powers of this present darkness, the spiritual forces 
of evil in the heavenly places as described as we read in Ephesians 6.12. And so what was their goal in all these attacks? What prompted them to single out this one boy who grew into a man, David? Their goal was to prevent and destroy any hope of the fulfillment of the promised Messiah. Because they knew it's going to come through this guy, the seed of David. He'll be born from David somewhere down the line. If we kill David, we kill the promised Messiah. If we take him out, then the prophecy all the way back in Genesis 3.16 is null and void, and we win the day. And so the fight was on. A spiritual fight, spiritual warfare. And so all of this, in the life, all of life's struggles for David had this spiritual element to it. And David was keenly aware of all this. And therefore he wrote this particular psalm, especially these first two verses. So notice the first thing he writes about in light of this knowledge that he has. Life is a fight. Life has a spiritual element to it, and often it's ugly, it's ruthless, and it's directed towards us. Notice what he writes. Verse 1, blessed be the Lord my rock, who trains my hands for war, my fingers for battle. Blessed be the Lord. The Hebrew word for blessed is barak. And in this context, context it means to give God all the praise, to credit him alone. For all the good, all the success, all the triumphs in your life. And so that's what David is doing here. Blessed be the Lord. We see this in other psalms as well written by David. Such as Psalm 145, verses 1 through 3. Notice what he says there. A psalm of praise of David. Again, he's giving God all the credit for whatever he's listing here. I will praise you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. I will bless you every day. I will praise you forever. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. His greatness is beyond discovery. So then back in our text, what is it that David is praising God for? What does he give give God all the credit for in his life? Look at verse 1 again. Blessed be the Lord, my rock. So this is where he starts. The Hebrew word for rock used here is Sur. Now, this isn't a reference to like a rock that you can pick up and throw, as magnificent as that is, you know, especially when you're a kid. But, and, and, you know, bear in mind, he used a rock to kill, you know, a giant, Goliath. But, but this is a different word. This is a different type of rock. Rather, David is talking about an outcropping of rocks or boulders. We see them all around us here. And so we, you have a good idea. You can envision it, I'm sure. And so they give us a picture of stability, a place to find refuge and protection from the enemy. And he's suggesting here to us is that God alone is the one that provides this rock. He is that rock. He's that place where you're running from your enemies in the desert or in the badlands or whatever, and you see it out in the distance, and it's like, that's the only place that I can make my final stand. I'm going to run to that place, and there I'll fight because I have a place to defend myself. I have a place for refuge. I have some semblance of protection, and so that's what he's praising God for. You are my rock. And so this is where your, spirit, your training for spiritual warfare begins. And you know what? Spiritual war- warfare, it's not exactly what you think. It's not exactly what we see depicted by Hollywood or YouTubers. It's not about you hunting for ghosts or demons in creepy old houses and graveyards. Because I think that's where we're at, right? That's where the world is at. And unfortunately, we're so influenced by the world, that's where most Christians are like, okay. When you're talking about spiritual warfare, it has to be me with, you know, uh, I don't know, a crucifix, some incense yelling at a demon, Beelzebub, be gone, or whatever, something like that. You know, that's what we think. It's interesting, um, not that it happens a lot, but I I get calls, you know, for people to to do those kinds of things, and I will respond to them. I'll talk with them. I'll pray with them. Typically, I share gospel with them because that's really the root of the problem. 
But they think like uh, pastors are like exorcists or something. And, you know, I know some pastor friends that they've fallen into this, and that's their gig. And it's a weird thing, you know, you can do that in your community. I'm sure if I put a Tim Castillo pastor, demon slayer, you know, I, I would have a thing, you know, and, and uh, I'm not doing that um, for a lot of reasons, by the way. That's not it. I, I, I don't think that that's it. I, I get it. There's people that perhaps have some interactions with things that are scary, that are unknown to them, mysterious to them, and very powerful. They've seen something, at the very least. And, of course, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go, and I'm going to talk to them, and I'm going to work with them, and mostly I'm going to share gospel with them and pray. That's it. And so this idea of engaging in spiritual warfare, what we think probably isn't what we're talking about. And it's certainly not exactly what Scripture is talking about. No, the battle is waged typically in your everyday mundane life. It's subtle, a thought, a temptation, reoccurring addiction, a sin that eats away at you like cancer and slowly but surely destroys you and those around you from the inside out. That's the fight. Now you get it, right? Now you see it more clearly. Because that's something that's affecting you every day. In your home. At school. At work. Everyday life. As you go. And you feel these things. Now then, by yourself, you're more than just vulnerable. You're powerless to fight these demonic powers. David, the warrior king, the apple of God's eye, knew this. And so what did he do? I know I can't do this all by myself. And I know it's not just these grand spiritual battles that we're talking about. It's everyday life. He had a spiritual battle and lost one day when he was supposed to be leading his armies out to war in springtime. Instead, what did he do? He's outside, kind of on the castle, you know, top, staring off of there, drinking a pina colada, and he's staring at naked women on top of their homes. That's what he was doing. Totally got slammed on. Lost the battle. And it affected him. It affected the nation. It affected everyone around him. That's the kind of spiritual warfare we're talking about. Those subtle things. And so he blessed God. He praised God. He knew, I cannot do this alone. He gave all, God all the credit. He pointed to God as the one and only rock in his life, his sure foundation and strength that enabled him to fight spiritually when he had to. And this is where you and I have to begin the fight as well. Just as the Lord once told the Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians Chapter 12, 9 through 10. Look at what he says there. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When we admit that we need God, that he has to be the foundation, the one that we turn to and look to for strength and wisdom and the ability to fight spiritually, when we begin on our knees in prayer, in humility, admitting our weaknesses, that's when God can be our rock and our strength in our life. Acknowledge that you're powerless, and then you'll be able to offer God the praise, all the credit for what he is doing and will do in your life. Secondly, God alone is able to train you for spiritual warfare. Look at verse 1 again. Of David, blessed be the Lord my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. So let's unpack that word train or trains real quickly. The Hebrew word for it is lamad. 
And of course, it, it refers to training. You know, I'm going to impart to you some knowledge. I'm going to equip you and give you what you need in order to do something. And given the military context of this verse, of these first two verses of uh, Psalm 144, it's obvious that David is talking about military training, more specifically, spiritual training. Again, it, this just is, isn't just about swinging a sword or holding a shield. This is spiritual warfare that he's talking about. Now, David talked about his own training, or at least it's recorded for us. It's 1 Samuel chapter 17, 33 through 37. This is the kind of spiritual warfare training he went through. Look at what it says. By the way, context real quick. It's Philistines on one side, nation of Israel on the other, and then a giant right in the middle calling them all out. Nobody's willing to go fight this guy, not even King Saul. And so they're at a stalemate, and it's looking bad for Israel because he's blaspheming the name of God in all of Israel. And so this kid, because he couldn't have been more than a teenager of some sorts, shows up just simply to bring food and water to his, his brothers who were fighting in the war. And he's like, oh, yeah, I can take him out. Somebody overhears him. He's like, go tell Saul. You know, it's, it's like a scene from a Mel Brooks film, right? The idiot's going to do it, you know, and so they drag him to King Saul. And he's like, sure, I got it. You know, I can do this. He puts on all sorts of armor on him. He's like, I can't wear this. I'm only like 13, 14 years old. This is armor for a man. I just need to go in the strength of the Lord, and I got this. And so th- this is the conversation they're having. And Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth. And he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and, uh, and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and I struck him and delivered him out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. That's his training. Not just physical, but spiritual combat training. That's it. Now, I'm fairly confident that none of us here have ever fought and killed a lion or a bear. Not with your bare hands and a stick, because that's what he's talking about. But for David, that was basic training. Tougher people back then, I'm just assuming. And again, there's a spiritual component to all of this. For instance, I thought about this. How how is this spiritual? And and then I thought about, well, Tim, have you ever seen a mountain lion? Or, you know, a bear out in the wilderness. And I really haven't. I've heard a bear. Uh, I've seen tracks of mountain lions. And that was enough to scare me right back to the vehicle, right? And so, because they were fresh. And I was like, he's, he's around here. But, you see, the only time we really see anything like that is at the zoo. Between real thick glass or a fence or something, bars. But you remove the fences and the safety glass that separates you from said lion or bear, and all of a sudden, you're having a super spiritual moment, right? Come to Jesus thing, like, dear Lord, save me. I love you, God, but here we are. That's what David was experiencing. He had fought and killed lions and bears as a kid, as a teenager. And he didn't do this, again, with a high-powered rifle with a scope at range or something. No, this was close up and stupid is what he was doing. It took faith. I say stupid not because, you know, I'm trying to hurt anybody, but, you know, who does that? Nobody. It took faith. It took this. God, I can't kill this bear, obviously. And 12... I have a stick in you. But this is what my father has asked me to do. Protect the flock. This is how we eat. This is how we take care of our family. So there's love involved. By the way, this is is the power of all of this. 
And I preach about love all the time. And I'm not talking about that warm, fuzzy feeling you get by sitting next to your girlfriend at church or something. That's not the kind of love I'm talking about. I'm talking about the kind of love that causes you to do things that require an immense faith, trust in God, to do things that seemingly impossible, not just dangerous, but foolhardy. You're putting your life on the line. That's what he was doing just in his training. Just as a kid, he was doing hard things that required faith. He wanted to do these hard things because he loved his family. He loved God. And we see this in the life of David. We see this in the life of all great men and women of faith in Scripture. Their motivation, it wasn't just like, I'm going to believe really hard. The reason they had faith is because I am loved. I know this because God loved me first. He sent his son to live, die, and rise again for me. So now I have this unconditional, sacrificial love in my heart. And now I have the capacity to love God in that same way, to love others in that same way. And so I have to do really hard things. Life is going to bring you hard things. Therefore, you need love, the love of God in your heart that allows you to have faith, this unwavering faith. When you have these two elements together, goodness, mountains are moved, no doubt. Giants fall over dead with a stone. Miraculous, powerful things can and will happen in your life when you have the love of God in your heart and your faith is focused exclusively on God alone. Things disappear. This is what David was doing. And so he, it's recorded for us. How did he train for spiritual warfare? Lions and bears. Love in his heart, faith not in himself but in God. How could he have faith in a stick in the strength of a 12, 13-year-old? Couldn't. Bear this in mind because this is the point of all this. Everything in your past, all the suffering, all the hardship, even that you're going through right now, everything in your past that required Love in your heart to get up in the morning and do again and again, even though it feels futile. That required love in your heart, faith in God instead of trusting in yourself. That was and is your basic training. God is using that to be your lion, to be your bear. He's preparing you to face your Goliath each and every day. Now then, there's something here that's easily overlooked. Here it is. It's the power of remembering, recalling what God has done in your past. We're always worried about the future. And if we look to the past, it's always with regret or guilt. We get all knotted up about that, and we're never present. We're never right here. And then we're all freaked out about the future. Goliath is looming, and now we're standing there with the army, and we're doing nothing until a little kid shows up and says, yeah, I got that. It's essential for us to reach back and see the hand of God enabling you, training you, to trust in Him and face your fears right now in the present. Think about it for a moment. Think of a time when God fortified your faith. He trained you as you faced suffering, hardship, an enemy, a spiritual enemy. Now, here's a a rough illustration, one from my past, our past, if you will, our families. Boys are little I'm working at the detention center as a guard. There's a couple of us that have done that. No fun. Required a lot of faith. I did it for four years. And yeah, it, 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 was, it, was, not, it was not fun, man. It was, it was tough. So I'm working there as a guard. I'm working graves, which was the whole time, I think. But uh, 
In any case, I'm in a section called work release. It's a little more lax, you know. Uh, it's not like D-Hall in Dark Dungeon, you know, at 3 in the morning and, and kind of creepy. But in work release, you know, I'm just sitting there and I get a call. And it's a personal call. It's my wife. And so it's Steffi, and so I pick up the phone. It's probably 10, 11 o'clock at night. She should be in bed, so I knew, like, oh, something's wrong. Maybe one of the kids are sick, whatever. And so I pick up. I said, hello, and she's like, do you have a moment? And I was like, sure, I got a moment. And she's like, we need to talk. Now, when your wife says that, gentlemen, then it's a, this is a real conversation, okay? We need to talk. You know, and so I was like, I'm all ears. Yes, what's, what's going on? She's like, look, you're working graves. I appreciate all that you're doing. Financially, we're not doing great. You know this. We were living with her parents at the time. If you ever lived with your in-laws, you may love them, but they'll grow to hate you, you know, <laughs> and it's a bummer. It's rough. And so, you know, that was going on. We had two kids going on number three. You were pregnant with number three, right? Right. And so it's like the joke yesterday. We had this birthday party celebrating the 90s, you know, for our, sister, our daughter-in-law. And uh, Stephanie said, I was pregnant in the 90s, so I'm going to come as a pregnant girl in the 90s because that's what I did. And so she was pregnant. And, and so she's like, look, uh, we're not doing well financially. You and I are not communicating very well. Uh, you're, when you're home, you're asleep, and you're not able to go to church. And so I was definitely physically, emotionally, spiritually absent. And so she said, something's got to change. And I filled in the blank. You know, something's got to change, and then I hear, or we're getting a divorce. Now, she didn't say that. But because of my upbringing and my broken home... That's where I went. I couldn't help it. And it was one of my greatest fears of all time. This was spiritual warfare on the biggest front for me. This, this was it. Like the world was crumbling down on me. And so what I did, I, I did this. I was like, oh, so I, I'm going to come home. I'm going to call our pastor. And we're going to do, do this right now, not later. And she's like, okay. And so I look at my supervisor, he's a lieutenant, and I said, hey, I have an emergency, I, I have to go at home. He's sympathetic, he's like, hey man, is kids going to the ER, what's going on? I said, no, my wife and I are having trouble in our marriage, obviously, and I've got to go fix this, not tomorrow, but right now. And he's like, if you leave, you're fired. I said, great, here's my keys, I'll turn in my stuff tomorrow. And I left. And I went home, called my pastor, uh, he's like, you can come over right now, or we can just pray over the phone, whatever you want to do. And now it's like midnight. And you know, we ske we'll schedule something for the morning. We'll meet you there at the church. And we started on a rigorous counseling kind of thing to save our marriage. And our communication was so bad, we, we kid with people that we do counseling with, that when we got into arguments, instead of talking, he forced us to, okay, Tim, here's your notebook and here's your pen and that's how you're going to talk to her because you got to slow everything down and it was vice versa and so we went through weeks months whatever worth of counseling and learned a lot and obviously we're still married that was all spiritual warfare some of you are going through it right now it's a spiritual battle every much as it is physical and emotional some of you have been through these fights. That is the hand of God. He brought you through those things. You need to look back. You need to recall how God saved your marriage, how God saved your life, how God saved you in the midst of that hardship and that suffering. And in doing so, because it robbed you of self-reliance, that hardship, and it forced you to trust in him that is what fortified you that is what trained you prepared you for the spiritual battles yet to come and then like David you will be able to say this the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine there are hard battles yet to face in your life all of you 
you're going to lose loved ones. Your kids, they're going to break your heart. Someone in your family is going, or somebody you love, they're going to get very ill in ways that you're, you, don't, you don't get to heal. You don't get to fix that. Your strength, your wisdom is going to be tried in ways you cannot imagine. I'm so sorry to tell you this. It's life. We live in a fallen world, and we get busted up all the time, and then we never think about the spiritual element of it, and we never think back and go, God, you've been preparing me. You robbed me of my self-reliance. Thank you, God. I bless your name. You have fortified my faith in you. I thank you, God. I bless your name. You have been training me all along for this moment. And even in this moment, it could be training me further for something else. Because this is what our life is. You need to look back and give God thanks for training you. Because he's the only one that can train you for it. Lastly, God will defeat your spiritual enemies. Look at verses 1 and 2 again in their totality of David. Blessed be the Lord my rock who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. Now we understand what that means. And then look at what it says. He is my steadfast love. He is my fortress. He is my stronghold. He is my deliverer. He is my shield. He in whom I take refuge, who subdues peoples under me. Now I want to start off with that final phrase there, found in verse 2. God who subdues people under me. Subdues or radad in Hebrew means, get this, and I'm quoting from the Hebrew lexicon here, uh, because it sounds so modern. It means to beat Someone down. Sounds like something you would say on the playground in Bloomfield, right? I'm going to beat you down. And that's what the word means. And now we all know what a beat down is, right? It's like Mike Tyson's first 17 fights. They all ended in just incredible knockouts. Scary knockouts. Where the guys did this and, you know, were mouthpiece was gone and all that. Many of them within the first few minutes of the first round. That's how vicious this guy was as a young fighter. And by the way, he was only 19 himself. He's a young guy. So now you can see it, right? This is the word that God chose to use to beat down. God subdued. That is, he beat down. He knocked out. He totally dominated and silenced people, a.k.a. enemies, under David. Lions, bears, giant named Goliath, King Saul, Philistines, and countless others, all of his enemies dropped by the power of God. Now then, here's the question. Why did God subdue David's physical and spiritual enemies? Why will God ultimately subdue your enemies? Why should you be fearless no matter what is going on in your life? How can you remain calm when everything in your life is turmoil and focused on you. One reason. Look at verse 2. He, meaning God, is my steadfast love. This is why. This is, this is the source of your strength, soldier of Christ. It is the love of God. By the way, this phrase, this word, steadfast love, it is my favorite Hebrew word in all of Scripture because it is also our granddaughter's name, Kesed. Refers to God's unwavering, inexhaustible grace and love for his sons and daughters. This is who you are. This is your strength. This is what can make you fearless in the front of any obstacle, any kind of enemy is first and foremost, it's not because of like, I'm smarter than you, I'm stronger than you. We don't get to do that. It's because I am the object of God's love. That's why I'm good. Oh yeah, I may get scared. It may be intimidating, but I'm not running. Why? Because God loves me. 
So what does God's steadfast love look like? Why do you find confidence, calmness in the storm? Because of this one word, kesed, steadfast love. Let's look at it. Isaiah 53. Some select verses, 3 through 6, also verse 10, thrown in there for good measure. Here's God's steadfast love ultimately. He was, meaning the promised Messiah, meaning Jesus Christ. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. He was nothing special to look at. If he walked by in a crowd, he isn't going to stand out. He's a guy. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. With his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Skipping down to verse 10. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for sin. Look, if you truly want to triumph over your enemies, then you first and foremost have to know that you're the object of God's love. This is the only way to do it. And the only way to really understand the love of God is to look to Scripture and read and find Jesus, the life that he lived for you out of love. I love you. Therefore, I'm going to overcome every obstacle, every temptation that took you out. I'm going to fight that battle for you. He was tempted in every way as you and I are tempted. He was tempted to lust. He was tempted to murder, to steal, dishonor his parents. All those things that you and I do readily. It's just in us. And we are defeated by our greatest enemy, sin, and ultimately the consequence of that sin, death. Jesus said, I'm going to take on this fight for you. It's now my fight. 33 and a half years, the onslaught, temptation after temptation. The devil himself shows up. Nothing. Why? Steadfast love of God. He loved you. He's like, I, yes, this is tempting. He felt it. But love motivated him to grind through it. Yes, he was God fully and completely. God cannot be tempted, but he was also fully and completely, perfectly man. I know that's mysterious, sounds contradictory and all that, but it's true. And so he felt the weight of every temptation. And he beat it every time out of love for you. And love for his father, no doubt. This is how we see it. This is how we understand it. Out of love for sinners like you and me, he he sent his son to live and then to die, to bear the weight of every sin you ever have or ever will commit. Not just yours, but the entire weight of the sin of the world he bore upon himself on the cross. And God the Father said, I will pour my wrath out on you instead of them. And in doing so, he defeated your greatest spiritual enemies, sin and death. Three days later, he rose from the grave, and that was it, man. We're down. We're down and out. Sin and death, your greatest enemies, have nothing on you. By the way, your greatest enemy, it is not that bill collector. As much as you hate him, I hate him too. I shouldn't because I owe money, but, you know, it's not your boss It's not your spouse that you're fighting with. It's not your kids. It's not your weird neighbor. It's not it. Your greatest enemy is sin. Your sin. Not you calling out other people's sins like, oh, I got to combat this. No, you. 
and then the death that comes with it. And I want you to know that those giants, Jesus already took out. Your greatest enemies are gone. We have nothing to fear. And all the things that you fear right now, look, I know this is a simple way to look at it. It's oversimplifying it. I get it. Big picture, 100 years from now, doesn't matter. You'll just be entering into that eternal place, being in the presence of God, and all these tears, all the fears, all the things that you had prior will be wiped away. And so this is the love of God, this kesed, this steadfast love of God. When you read Isaiah 53, you see that prophecy of old that not only predicted, but out of love predestined what happened on Calvary's hill. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. God has defeated your greatest enemy, sin and death, through his steadfast love, the sinless life, the sacrificial death, the empty tomb of his son. Now then, the only way God is your fortress, your stronghold, all these things there in verse 2 of Psalm 144, your deliverer, your shield, your refuge, is by God's grace through faith in Christ alone. In other words, the gospel. Look, this isn't so much about God defeating your current and future enemies. No, it's about you understanding that God has already beat down, destroyed your truest and most deadly enemies, your sins that enslave you, and in the end, condemn you to eternal death. And without Jesus, none of this stuff matters. Look, it's not a matter of if, it's, it's when. When the devil comes prowling around like a roaring lion, seeking to devour and destroy you and yours, remember, God has prepared you for this fight in your past. Remember that he has already won the war. You will have to fight some battles during your lifetime, no doubt. But Christ has already won the day. I leave you with this last quote from Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. Notice what it says. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us of all our trespasses, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. And get this. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him, in Christ. Christ has won the war. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the comfort, for the courage that comes from knowing that you have trained us for spiritual warfare. And Lord, you have won that battle through the life, death, and resurrection of your Son. And there are some here, Father, I know, and I count myself among them, that are currently engaged in some hard stuff. And we, our eyes have been opened. We know there's a spiritual element to it. And we're not going to discount that. Lord, help us to stand courageous, to live as Christ would live in this moment, to not betray the faith that we profess, to be steadfast in our love for you, just as you're steadfast in your love for us, Father. And then by faith in you alone, endure, know that the fight is won, and that you love us, Lord. May you be with us all now. Be with my brothers and sisters as, that they're, as they leave this place and they get in the fight. Father, give them strength and love in Jesus' name. Amen.